business in terms of the requirements and the type of stuff. So we have a mostly senior sem here, but we've got some visitors um, from who are just interested in, in hearing. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Christy. Great. All right. So can y'all, y'all can hear me just okay? Yep. All right. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to try sharing my screen. I will say that we are a Google house. So hopefully they actually just allowed us to start using Zoom. So um, it looks like y'all can see. Uh, so thank you for having me here today. Um, Dr. Butel reached out. Um, it's been almost a decade since I was in your seat. So it's, it's great to be on the other side. Um, I asked what you guys would be interested in hearing about and, you know, Karen kind of responded and was like, oh, just, you know, talk about your day-to-day -day life at Coast Survey. Um, but I remember sitting in your shoes and, you know, I had just finished field studies and I was on a high from that. I was like, what the heck am I going to do after college? Um, and so I kind of wanted to take a step back and provide even more of like just a general overview of the Office of Coast Survey and um, the various entry points that we have for, for recent graduates. Um, so I, I will certainly cater and talk to you what my branch is predominantly in pursues and is interested in, but I do want to kind of talk about like all of Coast Survey as well um, to see where y'all can go. Um, I guess just a little about me. I, I graduated from College of Charleston. I was a Beamer. Um, how many of y'all are Beamers? Yes, good choices. It's the ocean's the best. Um, so I was, I think I was second year Beamer, um, so a little older. Uh, I, I went to the University of New Hampshire after graduating from College of Charleston uh, to do the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping program. Um, from there, I stayed on as a research scientist for a few months looking at post-Hurricane Sandy marine debris identification. And then I joined Coast Survey. Um, I did a brief stint with Department of Defense at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency but I've predominantly been in Coast Survey for the past eight years. Um, I love the mission, which hopefully comes across in this presentation. Um, and we have a lot of Beamers and a lot of College of Charleston uh, former graduates on the team. So um, just diving right in, the title is the right place, right resource, right time. Um, so my, my team is really responsible for identifying where should we survey? So where sh across the nation, where should we deploy our limited resources? Um, so I'm going to kind of take you through the steps that we think about when we're um, trying to identify where to deploy our, our limited resources. Okay, so just a little history lesson on the Office of Coast Survey. So it is one of the first U.S. government science agencies, and it was enacted by President Thomas Jefferson in 1807. Um, Coast Survey had a pretty integral part in the Civil War when Union soldiers were navigating south and meeting the Confederate soldiers, they would send out Coast Survey surveyors on the front end to get an understanding of what the depths are, where the hazards are, so that Union soldiers could safely navigate the waterways. Um, upon having them assist with the Civil War, they really noted the importance, not just from a Department of Defense or from a, a Navy perspective, but how critical understanding the depths and where our obstructions are is to just support maritime transportation across the U.S. Um, so two centuries later, we're still serving that mission. So acquiring critical bathymetric data and feature information so that our mariners can safely navigate our waterways. Um, one of the things on the banner on the bottom, you'll see that we fall under the Department of Commerce. Um, and that was something that was perplexing to me for the first bit of my career because I felt like we were such a scientific agency. I was like, why are we involved in the Department of Commerce? Um, and I'll kind of go into a little bit on that on the next slide. Um, so here we have a graphic of the evolution of draft over the years. So beginning on the left side of the graph in 1970, all the way up to present in 2020, you can see that the draft of vessels or like the distance between the sea surface and the bottom of the hull of the boat is ever increasing. So what was a deep draft vessel at like nine meters in 1970 is up to 15 meters today. Um, and so we know that the seafloor isn't changing without human interaction any considerable amount. Um, but as these vessels are navigating closer and closer to the seafloor, our error margin is just decreasing. And so it's becoming even more critical for us to understand where those depths are. Um, just a little perspective, in many of our major ports, so like Port of Long Beach, Houston, 
Um, New Orleans, vessels are coming in with inches under their keel. Um, I was fortunate enough, I was able to ride down the Mississippi River a few years ago with one of the pilots. And he explained to me that so he's this multi, like 300 foot cargo ship. Um, and he's driving down the Mississippi River and he's like, yeah, you know, I know I'm close when I can hear it shuddering. I can feel the shudder. And that just was like a mind blowing point for me. I was like, wow, like you are skimming the surface of the seabed um, and carrying millions and millions of dollars worth of cargo. Um, so it's just, it's really important that we know what those depths are. Um, taking a step back, I think as geologists, you all understand that like maps are the foundational data set that we use to ask um, scientific questions. And that's the same for ocean science. So um, the bathymetry of the seafloor, the topography of the seafloor, that's the foundational data set that we use to do coastal inundation modeling and um, forecast hurricanes. And um, it's just beyond navigation, we have a much broader purpose of providing that data set to the public so that they can use it for to ask various scientific inquiries. Okay, so hopefully at this point I've convinced you that what we do is important and it's ne necessary. Um, so the, the next question is kind of like, well, how do we do it? Um, and what is our responsibility? So it's a tall order. Um, the Office of Coast Survey is responsible for the mapping and charting of the entire US exclusive economic zone. So that totals 3.4 million square nautical miles of seafloor. Um, and on quick analysis, we estimate around 60,000 square nautical miles is um, surveyed to modern standards, which means that we have a lot of work to do and understanding our resources, which is around 3,000 square nautical miles um, that we can complete annually, it would take us roughly 1,100 years to map our waters to modern standards, which is like six times longer than Coast Survey has been around. So it's a really, really big, big problem that we have. Um, and I think what it really drives home is that it's critical that we deploy the right resource to the right place at the right time so that we can aim our limited resources to the most um, critical navigation needs. And that's ultimately what my branch is responsible for. Um, so where do we need to survey? How do we prioritize those areas? And then what assets do we send to any given location? All right, so starting off, what resources do we have at our disposal? Um, so we kind of segment our resources into two fields. We have our in-house hydrographic fleet, and then we have our contracted hydrographic fleet. So the top panel shows our in-house ships. Um, I hope that some of you have maybe had the opportunity to sail on some, um, but we have two vessels on the West Coast, uh, the NOAA ship Rainier and the NOAA ship Fairweather. And these are sister ships. They both predominantly work in Alaska. Um, they are each outfitted with four launches. So four small 28 foot boats that detach from what we call the mothership on a daily basis to, to, to go acquire survey data inshore in the coastal waters. And that allows the ship to acquire data in the deeper waters. Um, and it really just maximizes efficiencies of the, of the survey program. Um, we also have on the East Coast, the NOAA ship Thomas Jefferson and the NOAA ship Ferdinand Hassler. So the Thomas Jefferson's a little bigger than the Hassler. She's 208 feet and she has two survey launches that also detach and all predominantly do multi-beam and side scan operations. The Hassler's unique. Um, she's, a, she's a catamaran and she actually has a multi-beam sonar, um, two multi-beam sonars on her hull, which allows her to get a much larger swath of the seafloor um, with the same level of effort. Um, but much smaller, 124 feet, and there's only about 14 crew aboard compared to the larger ships, which have between 30 and 50 people aboard. We also have a pretty extensive, extensive autonomous fleet. So we have autonomous surface vehicles, autonomous underwater vehicles, and we're currently exploring converting some of those 28-foot launches to um, uncrewed uh, systems. And so that on a case-by-case -case basis, they can be actually operated in an uncrewed mode. So those are in-house assets for the hydrographic fleet. We also have a pretty extent, extensive contract program. Um, so this is, we have a $250 million contract, um, which is used over five years based on funding that we received from Congress. 
um, across the seven vendors on the lower panel. Um, so the Beamers, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Geodynamics, Dave Bernstein, we work with pretty regularly. I know he's really involved with College of Charleston. Um, we also work with all the vend other vendors below. And so for, for those of you that have you know, the ocean mapping background, they certainly are well aware of the College of Charleston program. Um, so I'd encourage you to pursue opportunities with them as well, but us first. Um, so just a general division the, with these resources, it's about 50-50. So 50% of our work is completed by in-house assets and then 50% is completed by our contracted fleet. All right, so the first step was write resources. Um, the second step is write place. Okay, so we, we touched on this a little bit. Um, so where, where do we go? The seafloor is really big. 53% um, we expect to be, uh, would characterize as actually unmapped across the USCEZ. Um, and so one of the critical questions that the team needs to, to figure out is where is the right place to go? Um, so I, I don't know how interactive we can be, but can you guys think of some factors that we would want to consider when we're trying to figure out where to go? Um, like, where would you want to send a ship? Would you want them to go to Charleston? Why would you want them to go to Charleston? Any thoughts? Yeah, someone said ports. Yeah, ports, that's right, major ports. Um, I'll let this next slide go. That's exactly right. So like there's a wide range of variables that we would consider with ports being a predominant one. Thank you for putting that up there. Um, we also want to think about like what's the depth in that area? How um, how much traffic is going into that location? Have there been a lot of reports of groundings? Are there a lot of hazards? So all of these things, um, if we looked at them and considered them discreetly, would be overwhelming. And so what we did is we combined all of these into a model, which we refer to the hydrographic health model. Um, I'm just gonna put, provide a high level overview of this because I think it's really cool, um, but it ultimately serves to strive to, to answer where should we prioritize our assets. So it's segmented into two sections. Um, we have the hydrographic gap and the hydrographic risk. Hydrographic risk is pretty self-explanatory. So like where it's really shallow, there's a bunch of traffic. If there's a lot of groundings, that's higher risk for another future grounding than an area that doesn't have those factors. Um, the hydrographic gap is where it gets interesting. So we think about what level of accuracy of data do we want? That's our desired survey score. So you can imagine in those areas in a port where the vessel is transiting very closely to the seafloor, we're gonna want a high accuracy data set. But as that distance between the hull and the seafloor increases, we can chill out, we can relax those requirements. So that's their desired survey score. How accurate do we want that data to be? And then our present survey score serves to answer like, well, what quality of data do we currently have? Um, and what's neat about this is it doesn't just simply consider what the quality of the data was when we acquired it. It takes that second fact and says, well, the seafloor actually changes and hurricanes happen. So what do we think the, the quality of the data is today, understanding that 20 storms have passed through since we've last acquired it? Um, so by differencing those two, what we want versus what we have, understanding that the seafloor changes, we can, get an under, we can get a better understanding of where we have a gap or where we need to acquire new data. Um, so I think I have an example from the Gulf of Mexico here. Um, so this is like poor graphics because I don't have a legend, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, so the dark green is gonna be our highest accuracy, light green to yellow to red, lower accuracy. And so you can see it, it makes sense. We want our highest accuracy data in the major ports along the Gulf. And then as you increase your distance offshore, we see that requirement generally de decreasing. The one on the right shows us the accuracy of the data that we have without applying depreciation. So without accounting for the fact that the Gulf has a bunch of storms. Um, so when you run the model, you can start to see, if you notice off the coast of Mississippi and off the coast of Louisiana, where we had higher quality data, this has since degraded to a lower quality. Um, and then when you take the difference between these two, you can get a picture of where we have a gap. Where is new data acquired, required to support existing surface navigation? And so this is the result. So anywhere is blue, 
we're good. We have the necessary quality of data that we need to support surface navigation. But those warmer colors are gonna indicate where we have a gap. Um, and we need to go deploy resources to acquire that. This is just a general overview of the hydrographic risk term. We talked about like traffic density, the Gulf is super busy, um, bottom type reported groundings, proximity to ports and reefs. These are all gonna have an impact on your likelihood of um, having a grounding and then the consequence of what that grounding would carry. So when you combine all of this information together, you get the output of the hydrographic health model. And this is what drives us to help answer the question of what, where is the right place to go? Um, so rather than having now to survey the entire EEZ or at least where we should focus our efforts within the EEZ to make the maximum impact. All right, one more variable, the right time. Um, so it would be great if we could acquire data across the US at any given time, but there's obviously some limitations just based on environmental factors. So um, for example, in the upper hand left corner, we have um, a lobster, lobster person laying lobster pots, and that has a very big impact for our ability to safely navigate and survey waters, because if you're having to dodge a bunch of lobster pots, that adds inefficiencies. Um, and we also want to be aware that those are like someone's primary means of income. Uh, we also have the ice extents in the Arctic, so we can't acquire survey data when there's um, an iceberg over the, the Bering Sea. Um, similar with, we need to be cognizant of whale migrations, when hurricanes are coming in, so not deploying assets in the middle of August and September in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the prime hurricane season. And then we even look at weather. So like if, if we're gonna have 50% weather take because there's gonna be unsafe to operate our vessel, maybe we should consider surveying earlier in the season or once the, the winds and the waves have died down. So taking that into account as well. All right, so once we have all of that sorted out, we come up with a plan. So we say, all right, based on all of these variables, this is where we wanna go. And this is where my team kind of brings it over the finish line. So they do all their front end analysis of where we think the, most the best place to go survey is. And then we draw out our survey estimates. So the part that goes into this is we have a bunch of environmental compliance. So making sure that we're upholding state and federal laws. Um, then we do a lot of stakeholder outreach and coordination. So talking with our federal and state partners and local governments, as well as um, academia and seeing if there's any emerging needs in the nearby area that they would potentially want us to consider in executing our survey. Um, we run estimates on how long it's gonna take, what's the cost gonna look like. And then we refine the project requirements, meaning what accuracy of data do we want? What features do we want the field to investigate? and we compile all of this into what we call the project instruction package. So at the end, we then can use that package to send the boats out and acquire these data. And because we've done our research, we know that we're applying the autonomous surface vehicles in those areas that are really shallow and maybe intricate shorelines that the launches wouldn't be able to easily navigate. We're using our launches in the shallow coastal waters and then we're reserving the ship work to the deeper offshore portions. Um, so we're acquiring the highest, like the best data with the right resource um, across the project bound. So just to tie it full back and full circle and how this makes it to our um, charts and our navigation services, um, on the left we have this source survey, so we'll get that beautiful grid of what the depths look like. We then have a, cart a cartographic eye towards what data we need to transform and put onto the cart, so we develop soundings and contours and feature data. And this ultimately results in an update to the chart. Um, so making sure that the mariner has the most up-to-date information from which they can make navigation decisions on. Like I said at the beginning, um, we are also thinking of our broader customer as well. So we really do consider ourselves like the experts with respect to bathymetry. And so as we continue to expand our um, user case, we are developing what we're calling the national bathymetric source. And what this is, is it's essentially going to be a tiled database that can suck in data from a whole range of users and sources. And it's gonna apply a supersession routine to make sure that the best bathymetric data migrates to the surface. So rather than having discrete surveys all over the place, it's gonna have one continuous surface from which scientists and our um, cartographers can pull from to inform their navigation products and services, but also that um, scientists can use as a foundational data set to make, to ask various questions. Um, 
So that was the final slide. This I, I did some rough math um, over the past few days just to look at the presence of College of Charleston within my division and Hydrographic Surveys Division. Um, and it's pretty, it was pretty neat. So 10% of our physical scientists are um, from the College of Charleston or part of the BEAMS program. But even more telling is that 30% are in leadership positions. Um, so it really just goes to show that co the co-survey just recognizes the expertise that College of Charleston has and those folks are being funneled up into leadership positions within the division. Um, I know Dr. Butel mentioned that the hiring process with the US government is different and it is. Um, I'm happy to talk to you guys about that. Um, I will also provide my contact information and I'd encourage you if you want, I'm happy to review resumes or kind of talk you through how to navigate USA jobs because it can be a bit of a beast. Um, but I guess that was my last slide if you guys have any questions. Christy, when you said uh, that you would talk about how to navigate applying to the government uh, jobs, I don't know if you could see it, but everybody was nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, the way I like to kind of suggest navigating that is they, it's definitely improved, um, but you'll likely have a questionnaire that you'll have to um, respond to. So you update your, you'll provide a resume, a cover letter, your transcripts, and then there'll likely be a question of like very specific project um, or very specific position questions. And I would just advise when you're going through those, you think of like the absolute best day that you've ever had in your life and how you were just like killing it from a like skill perspective. And that's the frame of mind that you want to have when you answer those questions. So meaning like you will just just take your best stab at it because um, that's going to be like the first hurdle of getting through HR. Um, so make just have that perspective when you're filling out that questionnaire. So a couple of years ago, and I don't even know if you were here when Jen Kist gave the talk in Senior Sem, and she was talking about how the government jobs, you know, you want your resume to be as long as possible, all the information to be on there. You don't want to compare it down because they can't ask questions, right? Is that still true? So I think, um, I don't know if I would focus on length more than quality. Um, so to be totally transparent, the way that my perspective of how this works um, is HR. So HR does the first look at the resumes. And if I was soliciting for a physical scientist position on the team, I, am, I only receive the applications that HR deems meeting the requirement. And so you have to understand like HR, they're not ocean scientists. They don't have, they might not know what hydrography means. Um, so when you're reading the position descriptions, like so the summary of what the job offer is, there's going to be keywords and like what they call um, KSAs, knowledge skills. I can't remember what the A stands for. But key phrases, you need to make sure that you you incorporate into your resume. Um, so if it says like experience with conducting hydrographic survey operations, say completed hydrographic survey operations on these things, like I would be as straightforward as possible. I mean, make sure it's true, don't lie, but like you're gonna wanna use the same terminology that's used in the description in your resume and in your cover letter. And that's true for across the government, right? Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can only speak for how I've seen it from my perspective, but all USA jobs, I think, typically goes through an HR hurdle before it goes to the subject matter experts. How long does it normally take to get through the government job application? <laughs> so I've heard the first part was how long does it take? And I couldn't hear the second part. Like how long does it take to go get through the whole application and then finally like if you make it all the way through and start a job? Like how long does that whole process take? Yeah, so it's 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 very variable. Um that's a tough question. It's super variable. I I just got hired for a position in six weeks, and I've also it's taken like four or five months. Um it, a lot of it is dependent on just how quickly HR is able to process everything. 
Um, and then for a new hire, it's going to be a little longer because you'll have to go through a background investigation, which can take a, two, a few weeks. Um, and then there's, once you get an offer, there's a bunch of paperwork you have to submit. Um, but at that point, you've like reached the longest hurdle. So I honestly, I would probably say between like two and four months um, is what you can expect for turnaround. Questions? So you went to grad school. Do you have a question? Yeah. Sorry. Um, oh, um, is it better to go through NOAA or like a contract to go through NOAA? Yeah, that's it. I mean, I think it's all just up to what your preference is. I think a lot of the time, you know, the contractor jobs, you're going to get hired. You can have the ability to get hired a lot faster because there's not as much, I think, like administrative stuff. But I think the, the thing with the contractor jobs is it's all a function of government funding. Um, I mean, right now we're on a continuing resolution, so we don't actually even have a budget for next year. Um, so when you're at, you know, you're hired as a contractor, you might be able to get hired faster, but it's like your job security isn't as strong maybe as, as having, being a federal employee. Um, but I, I would say like two of my team members right now, they were initially contractors and now they're federal employees. So they, they made the decision to switch, but they also really enjoyed their time as a contractor. And I'm thinking, I guess I'm thinking of you as like doing a contractor for the federal government. I think if you want to be like geodynamics, Lidos or Fugro, um, that would totally be your preference. I mean, that would be like, you'd be incorporated into their business structure and their family. Other questions? So for, as a Beamer, you went to grad school, but a lot of the Beamers don't go to grad school. What do you think about did grad school give you something or was it necessary? What, what was your feeling on grad school? Or was it just fun because you got to geek out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably all of the things. Um, I, uh, I really, I enjoyed graduate school. I really, I like being in a learning environment. I was very close to staying on for my PhD, but ultimately decided not to. Um, I don't, when I think about it, I. I was probably hired in at the same, I was hired at the same position I did after grad school as I did not out of grad school. Um, but I don't know if I would have gotten that offer letter maybe right out. I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I think I, I really enjoyed graduate school because it allowed me to expand my um, focus on ocean mapping in particular, whereas like undergrad was much more broad with geology. Um, and I think it just comes down to if you want to stay in like an academic space or, or go right into the career service. I will say you shouldn't pay for graduate school. You should be paid to go to graduate school. And um, that, I mean, that is a big factor. You don't get paid much, but you do, you do get some money. <laughs> you should. Quiet today. Um, so I know it's been a while, but can you think about anything that helped you get through the graduate school application process? You know, was there anything that you remember as being critical? Yeah, so I, I mean, Doc actually encouraged me um, to apply to the various programs. I, the thing, the one thing that I would strongly recommend doing is if you see a program that you're interested in, do some background research, look at res research papers that those professors have recently published, see if your research interests align with any of, any of them, and then reach out to them. Send them an email. I'm sure any of the your advisors would be happy to review the email before you send it to them um, and, and kind of explain to them about a little bit about your history, where your interests lie, and why you think that you would be interested in pursuing the same research that they're looking into. Um, a lot of the graduate programs rely on um, like research, like the, the actual uh, professor securing their own grant funds. And so a lot of it is about like, if your research interests align with that professor, and if you think they think you'd be a good fit for where they need um, further research development. And so if you can make that interaction before the application process, 
um, your name will be at the top of their list and you'll, it'll be familiar to them when they're reviewing the applications. Uh, Christy Doc had a question about what did you have to do to get into UNH? Something about physics. Yeah, physics is really important, you guys. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that's the one thing I would, I didn't have a physics background. Um, and I think I was, I do not think they would accept me without a physics background now. Um, it was hard, physics was really hard. Um, but it's, if you wanna go into acoustics, if you wanna go into ocean mapping, it's pretty fundamental. I, it, I think it's a prerequisite, you have to have it. Now at CECOM, I'd have to double check, but um, I know when I was at College of Charleston, it was, you could choose biology or physics. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, but I would encourage you to to go with and go with physics if you can if you can handle it. Other questions? Okay, so um, I realize that you're in a you know in a single office within NOAA, but a lot of these guys are whether they're in beams or climate or any structure. I don't think I have any structure people this year, but um, are interested in that intersection of feeling like they're making a difference. And so clearly you're making a difference with transportation. Do you feel like NOAA provides that feeling of being science, but making a difference? Like, is that a place they could look for jobs that make them feel like they're doing more than just research for the sake of research? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's something that NOAA, I mean, Coast Survey in particular, but NOAA as a whole does really well. Um, I, yeah, I think, so I, I think that the main, my main driver is that I so believe in, in our mission and, and the science that it does support. Um, and it's really interesting to see it from the perspective of how the science and even just the data that we're acquiring kind of trickles throughout um, academia and other governments. And um, it also provides you opportunities to work with other federal agencies like USGS and BOEM. So you can kind of explore that, the scientific questions that they're inquiring about. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I, we planned a mission this year in partnership with the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab and they were acquiring carbon and oxygen uh, measurements throughout the Bering Sea on an autonomous platform. Um, and we were able to talk with them to understand like, well, what are the implications of the oxygen and carbon uh, measurements that you're taking? Because we were really only interested in the depth stuff. So there's always that option to like reach further and reach with like other collaborators and scientists to kind of ask additional questions um, and see how your small part fits into the much broader picture that NOAA supports. Um, Oh, so hi, my name is Hansel. I just have a question. Is it important to specifically know like Noah's mission, like when you're applying to talk about it during the interview? Or... Um, during the interview, I, I don't, not necessarily. I mean, I guess I would do just some like general over. It's sometimes it's hard to navigate these stinking government websites. Um, but just get a general idea of what the office supports. Uh just to have that context. Um, but no, I don't think it's critical. I The way that I typically prepare for an interview is, um, so you can look up the standard questions, right? Like, how do you deal with conflict? Um, explain a time where you had to solve, you had a problem and how did you solve it? How did you navigate it? Um, what do you think your professional strengths and weaknesses are? Do you, are you a good team player? Um, but then I think of like, three to five past projects that I've worked on and I write them out. What was the problem? What, where, what is the background information? What was the problem and how was it solved? Um, and then I think about like what different questions I could pivot to use that response towards. Um, and so that's something that's really helped me because I think when you're in an interview, a lot of it is um, part of it is making sure you have the skill set. Like most of that we can glean from like the resume and then just asking questions um, to verify that that what you're saying is true. Um, but a lot of it is like, are you going to be a good fit for the team? Are you going to integrate well? Um, and so making sure that you just have like 
your background research as far as like your ducks in a row with being able to defend your resume, I think is probably the most important part. That's at least what I found to work well for me. Thank you. Other questions? Friday before Thanksgiving week. I know, I commend all of you for being here. I, was, <laughs> I realized, I was like, oh wow, what a poor date to choose, but. Um, and you said you'd be willing to put, give them your contact information um, after they think about it a little more, I think some of them will definitely want to reach out individually and ask specific, real specific questions. A bunch of them are nodding because they want to ask. Yeah, thank you. I would love to, I, I would love to talk to y'all. Um, can I send that to you, Dr. Retail? Yes, I have your Gmail. Do you want the official one? Yeah, Gmail's fine. That, that works. Okay, so I'll give the Gmail and as you can see, they want to like to talk about what you do, and then they want to hear what you're doing, and you know, they do want to talk to you. Yes, okay. Bye, dog. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? Okay. Thanks so much, Christy. I'll uh, send them the thing. And do you want the report a uh, copy of this recording? Um, sure. I, either way is fine. That's something that you can put in your um right resume box. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Right. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, y'all. Thank you, Christy. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.